So good evening. You know I'm going to do that again if you've been here before. Good evening. good evening. All right. On behalf of KPCC Southern California Public Radio, welcome to the Crawford Family Forum. My name's John Cohn. I'm the managing producer of KPCC In Person. That is our events and engagement platform. Uh, KPCC is a multi-platform organization in that we have content on air, online, and in person. Um, Tonight's event we're doing with Take Two, our friends uh, on, on, on the, on the 89.3 FM dial every morning, 9 to 11 a.m., co-hosted by Alex and A. And one of the things, we do events around Southern California, content events, engagement events. We have fun stuff. We have serious stuff covering a range of topics and issues. But one of the favorite things I think that, that I have that we do is partnering with great organizations around Southern California. Uh, this series is something that we launched in partnership with the Art Center College of Design, and we couldn't be more thrilled to be doing that. Tonight's the second installment, and to talk a little bit more about that, I want to introduce you to the VP of Marketing and Communications for Art Center College of Design, Jared Gold. Thanks, John. Thank you. We are uh, also thrilled to be partnering with KPCC. In my mind, both KPCC and Art Center uh, are quintessential Southern California organizations. We're both a place where ideas are exchanged uh, that are centered around the human experience. So my only question is, why did it take so long? It's a really good question, uh, Jared. I don't have an answer <laughs> to that. Uh, through Art Center's big alumni network and industry partnerships, we can tap into creative minds that are influencing change around the world. Uh, this series allows us to take a closer look um, here in Southern California. Fast Forward is, celebrates the design, innovation, and technology happening here in our own backyard and how that's going to influence our lives in the not too distant future. Great, thanks, Jared. You know, one of the things, we, we have been talking about this for a long time, and you know, KBCC, we're news. We're talking about right now, what's happening right now. When we talk about futures planning, it's like, okay, what's tomorrow morning, right? So I think just sort of expanding our capacity to take a longer, sort of longer view, um, you know, and, and, and this collaboration has certainly been a big part of uh, helping us do that. So to kind of formalize that a little bit, we're like, what's the format gonna be? Like, oh, we really like conversation, we really like news, we really like interviews, so tonight we're gonna do a little bit of everything. We're gonna start with what we call seven and seven. Uh, seven years and seven minutes, it'll be a little bit of a, a sort of presentation, and then it'll uh, become a conversation with Alex Cohen and special guests to really make sure we're covering a lot of the different aspects of the subject tonight. So now on to the really fun stuff, housekeeping. Uh, we are live video streaming right now, and we are audio recording. Uh, some of this will air on take two uh, in the coming days and or weeks. I will confirm with Joe when exactly that's happening. Um, so as far as as uh, phones, great take photos, participate in social media. The handles and hashtags are up on the screen. Photos are fine, just we ask not to do flash and please no video. We're taking care of video, so no Facebook Live. It's gonna be strictly, strictly enforced with the KPCC police that are here this evening. Um, but mostly just thank you so much for coming and being part of the conversation. Like I said, we are recording, so if you wanna support the experience, if you feel applause or any kind of warm uh, response that we can hear, that would be great. It enhances a live experience. You don't have to be totally silent. Uh, and just. Have a good time and thank you so much for coming. And without further ado, I'd like to, and please turn off your ringers and all those kinds of sounds, that would be great. It's a nice reminder, that was like on <laughs> cue, it was great. It's almost intentional, right? Um, so without further ado, I wanna introduce you to the co-host of Take Two and your host for the evening, Alex Cohen. Thank you so much. I know it's been a really long, fascinating, turbulent week for everybody, and I just want to say thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, it's really great to actually see people. It's one of the things that in radio we very seldom do because we're trapped behind a glass, which is why I can say, Jared, I know why this hasn't happened before. Radio people, oh man, we are so great with audio. We're so awful when it comes to visual stuff, <laughs> spatial designs. It's been really fun for me. I was just giving our guests tonight a little tour around the studios, and it's really fun to watch them marvel over things. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's just the soundproofing. It's not a big deal. But they see the beauty in it, which is really lovely for me. Uh, as John mentioned, we're going to start off with a little presentation. And uh, to do that is Karen Hoffman, who is chair of the product design department at Art Center College of Design. So Karen, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Alex. And thanks for that great tour of KPCC behind the scenes. Uh, yeah, we could spend more time doing that. So hello, everybody. Really happy to be here. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, excited to talk about this very um, important topic called considered consumerism. 
And so a little bit of background about what this all means. Uh, it's been about a decade now since I've been watching what's going on at Art Center, observing uh, through the classroom, through some of our projects and programs like Design Matters, which has a definitive uh, focus on social innovation, and our commitment in our department to designing for sustainability. We've seen a lot of great projects that students have created that really are shifting the way that we are seeing things being made uh, for good. We also have an amazing generation of students that have formed uh, things like Eco Council that are doing good around campus as well. So there's a mindset in this next generation of creatives that have really spirited this conversation. Along with our partners, um, corporate partners like Jared had mentioned, we do a lot of work with uh, footwear companies and you'll see some examples of that tonight. Uh, this was an example from Nike, uh, the considered line that they developed several years ago that really tried to make the most sustainable footwear possible. So you'll see this woven moccasin type of shoe, but what was really cool about what they did at Nike was they decided, let's just integrate this kind of thinking into everything that we do. Hence, a Jordan shoe that you could not imagine having the same design principles and manufacturing technologies. It doesn't look like it's been uh, made with sustainability in mind. And then, of course, speaking of Portland, where Nike's headquartered at, you know, we've had a lot of culture shifting, too, around how things are made, um, organic foods. And, of course, our friends in Portlandia um, have taken it to a very humorous level, but it is a signal of what's happening in our culture. So just a real quickly, a few indicators of where I see some trends going that support this idea of considered consumerism. It's really this mindset that's growing and it's technologies that are enabling and transforming from consumer to, uh, to from, from the corporations to the consumers. Revisiting our friends at Nike, they made an initiative five years ago to partner with organizations like NASA and other US agencies to invite innovators and thought leaders from around the world to gather at events and throw out challenges uh, like water and energy, um, recently chemistry, to share knowledge around what these systems could be like, what these products could be like, how they could be made differently. Um, we've seen a lot of accelerators come from this type of activity, so it's very open source thinking. Their biggest competitor, Adidas, um, is also investing into what they call future craft. So what are the technologies that allow them to be nimble, uh, 3D printing, new kind of material sciences, also sustainability, and of course customization is a big part of this as well. And you'll see something coming out very soon. This is the first mass customized, or mass uh, made shoe, mass manufactured from ocean waste. They partnered with uh, Parley to collect all the different plastic trash that we see in our oceans and turn that into materials for manufacturing. So this is an example. Uh, they said that each pair of shoes is around 10 or 11 water bottles. And our own students um, took on a challenge with vans. Uh, vans came to us wanting to know, what, is th what are these sustainable ecosystems of the future? What could it look like? So our students really explored not just what the products could look like, what the different manufacturing um, capabilities could be, but also really thinking about the whole system. And that's really important for us, is systems thinking, thinking long-term vision, considering beyond the product, uh, what is the whole experience. We're deep into maker and creative culture. The evidence is everywhere. We have a lot of maker labs popping up all over the nation, all over the world. People are getting together, learning how to code from all ages. There's a deep appreciation for craft and longevity that's really rising up, and our guests, um, you'll hear from later, are really going to talk more about that. Um, and then really getting away from disposability, so fix-it culture and repairing things. Um, and being involved, being participating in these kinds of activities. And of course, the king of craft, uh, Etsy, continues to grow, uh, letting, enabling people from all over the, the, the nation to take their craft to the market, and now partnering with retail outlets like Whole Foods. And we've seen a huge growth of uh, these alternative retail markets, uh, craft markets, craft fairs, not just during the holidays, but really year-round. And the big driver is this meaningful experience economy. And the crowdsource platforms, the crowdfunding that we've seen, really takes uh, the users, the consumers, into how things are made. Uh, it allows people to invest not just their money, but really their emotion and their experience into, into the creator's world. 
And you're going to hear more from uh, Spencer Nicosi from Kill Spencer and Grant Delgatti with Irby. And they've done a masterful job at doing these things. Uh, another contributor to this meaningful experience are these communities around uh, service design and the sharing economy. You know, a few years ago, Airbnb and Netflix and Uber, these were, you know, real groundbreaking uh, companies that were like, really, you were going to you're going to share, share your apartment, rent your apartment out? We're going to change the taxi industry? Well, yeah. Um, and now it's been normalized. It's part of our life. It's part of our community. And in the future, we're going to have healthier choices. And that's really going to be enabled by a lot of technology. We've seen big box retail, like Walmart, commit to sustainable practices. Uh, we've seen them try to go more local um, on their resources. We have companies like IBM creating augmented reality platforms where you can actually see how products are being made. You can see who's making them, what's in them, their own ingredients similar to food in the future. And perhaps, just like architecture has LEED certification for sustainability, we could imagine that products could have a similar uh, scoring system. And then finally, products with purpose. And that's really a big driver for this conversation tonight. There's a couple of authors that just wrote a book called Good is the New Cool, and it's really about this millennial mindset, right? It's about experience, not just products. It's about sharing, not having sole ownership. And it's really this entrepreneurial mindset. So it's the brands that are really creating a new kind of commerce in partnership with culture, the artists, and also the nonprofits that are bringing the consciousness in. And some great examples that we've seen, you know, the kings and our legacy of commitment are companies like Patagonia. They've committed their whole business model um, around creating product that is, is good for the world as well. We see some young startups in Detroit um, that have a social uh, impact side to it. This young lady, Veronica Scott, the empowerment plan, she created coats and outerwear and sleeping bags for the homeless in Detroit, but instead of just making them, she's hired women that have been homeless in Detroit and giving them jobs to make the bags. And then those of you that are familiar with Tom's and perhaps Warby Parker, that kind of business model is awesome. It's a new way of, of consuming and trying things on, but it's also about giving back. So anytime you buy a pair, you give a pair for somebody who's in need. Perhaps the biggest challenge is fast fashion. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about how that industry really does need to transform, and it's exciting to see companies like H&M create an entire collection around conscious design. Look good, do good, feel good. And I'll end with this quote from a sustainable food expert, author, educator, Anne LaPay. Uh, Every time you spend money, you're casting your vote for the type of world you want to live in. So thank you very much. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much for that. It's great to have all those visuals as we launch into this. I want to welcome now to the stage the two guests that Karen mentioned. We've got sitting to her left, Grant Delgatti, who is Chief Creative Officer and co-founder of Irby. And sitting next to him is industrial designer Spencer Nicosi, the man behind Kill Spencer, a line of sustainable and waterproof backpacks designed and manufactured in Atwater Village. Thank you all for taking the time tonight to come out. Uh, the first thing I want to ask, because, and I, this comes in part from, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a radio person, so I hear things, I don't see things, and I don't make things. I do it very poorly, and I'm not ashamed to admit that. I recently made my daughter's first Halloween, the first, I've bought her plenty of Halloween costumes, but this year I decided to make it. I don't know if I'll ever do that again. I'm curious about when you first made something, or your earliest memory of making something that really stood out to you. What was it? Why did you make it? How hard was it to make? Who wants to start? Let me go first. Go for it. Hey guys, what's up? I'm Spencer. Um, the first product I think I made was uh, I was like seven or eight. I made a product called a bind board, and a I wanted bind board? a bind board. It was like I wanted to attach my feet to my skateboard like a snowboard, and so I uh, screwed webbing onto a skateboard, and I slipped my feet in, and then I could literally jump off of this without losing the board under my feet. And it was kind of like skateboarding. It was like snowboarding in the streets, uh, which was kind of dangerous, but it allowed 
you know, when you're younger, doing you can do tricks a lot easier. I feel like the that people like in the my, audience are marketing, like writing that down. I'm gonna yeah, steal I, that I was idea. Actually, it's a good I idea. Sold, I sold them to my friends, um, and we was like a little, I don't know, not really a business, but we just for thirty bucks we would, you know, make these little bind boards for our friends, and it was like a little culture of kids with helmets skateboarding and in West Hills, California. So that's fabulous. <laughs> and you were seven. What did it feel like when you could actually make it and skate with it? How did that? feel to I'm, you yeah, when you're a kid you're I guess you know you grow up I was playing baseball and you know my life was very leisure driven when you're that young so um, it was really cool to be able to to make that idea a reality and I was very supported by my parents my parents are both designers mm -hmm. and so they're always like yeah you should make that happen let me show you how the drill works let me show you how the you can screw screws into the skateboard without them going all the way through and then being dangerous so I don't know yeah. That's fantastic. Grant, how about you? What's the first thing you remember making? So I, I'm, I'm kind of similar to Spencer. I think you were a little more entrepreneurial in your younger years than I was. I, I sort of just made things for myself because I thought that I was my, my own consumer. So um, the, the thing that I remember that I was really proud of uh, that I made was probably, I was probably about 10, a little later uh, in life, but um, I made a, 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 a soapbox. Um, little go-kart was I made out of plywood I borrowed my dad's uh, uh, jigsaw and I cut out a pattern and made this whole thing and I used parts off of um, off of a, a kind of a, a really old stroller you know the kind of strollers that had those uh, tin uh, uh, wheels like the like a plate a pram almost yeah yeah, yeah. and they had like a solid uh, rubber uh, you know uh, tire around it it was white of course the tires were white and uh, I remember we actually took the the, the uh, handle from the, the push handle of the stroller and we converted that, my dad and I uh, made that into a uh, roll bar. And uh, what, uh, what <laughs> I'm also a bit of a daredevil and so uh, we used to live on this hill that, uh, that honestly, you know, you should never even think about riding down on a bicycle, let alone something like this. And uh, my parents said absolutely no way, but you know, one day they weren't home and so, um, so me and my buddies went up to the top of the hill, and and uh, the only brake that I had on the thing was the little lever that would actually lock the wheel. You know, it wasn't actually a brake, and I didn't realize it at the time. I thought that would be a good brake. And so I got about halfway down this hill. I think I'm doing about 30 miles an hour at this point, and I go to, to slowly put the brake on, and as soon as it touches the tire, the thing just goes, and flies away, and I'm now brakeless, and... I tried to negotiate the turn into my little street, uh, uh, and uh, of course uh, the G-forces were a little too strong, and the two tin wheels on the outside instantly both went like this, and the bolts landed into the cement, and the thing went flying, tumbling over, and uh, it turns out that the little handle actually saved my life, so it was, uh, <laughs> it was, it was good we put it on there. You live to tell, let's just say for the record, the Urbies are a little bit more stable than that. Yeah, Is that I've, safe I've, to I've say? incorporated some of my design process into, <laughs> into what we now it have. It has breaks. So, yeah. uh, and Karen, what about you? What, what are your earliest maker memories? First of all, it all makes sense, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think more on the hacking. You know, I think my, my first memory was really, I, I loved Hot Wheels. I wasn't your normal little girl. Um, Hot Wheels, Legos, I remember setting them up and modifying them to do what I wanted to do with it and using Legos as bridges and kind of combining different toys together and seeing how high I can get the cars to fly and um, kind of got rowdy with that at times. But uh, that was really my first memories was uh, as seven or eight was really just hacking a whole bunch of toys together. Mm. That was kind of my, my thing. And before we delve into what considered consumerism is and what it means right now, I've been thinking a lot about, because it feels to me that there probably was a time, not only in this country, but throughout the world, where everything was considered consumerism and products had to last because you didn't have that much in the way of materials. And, you know, we couldn't mass produce things. When do you feel kind of like we lost sight of that because it, it always feels to me like vinyl right everyone's getting back to vinyl now but we have had that foray into cassettes and and mp3s and all the rest of it but there was a time where vinyl was the only option when did things change in the product world i think really when technology enabled ma materials to be made in a mass production because i do think there was obviously a time in in the beginning of the last century where 
you had to invest in certain products. It was an invest, a true investment, and there was a culture of fixing it. That was just what you did. If it didn't work, you fix it. You just can't go out and buy a new one. Um, but I think as technology and improvements on products and economies uh, changed, accessibility to getting the new evolved. And my guess is around the 70s, and then it really started taking off, I think, in the 80s. Um, so sort of mass consumption uh, because of both economy and technology. But now it seems we're swinging back. Uh, Grant and Spencer, and Grant, let's start with you. What does considered consumerism mean to you personally? So for me, uh, especially with, with the product that, uh, that uh, we're producing now, is, is it's really about problem solving. It's looking at what the world is, where the world is going, what the world needs, and looking at opportunities to create solutions that make a lot of sense. And, um, you know, I've always, uh, I, I've, I, I, before Irby, I started a, a, a shoe company, actually, that uh, had a kind of an eco-conscious uh, uh, flavor to it. And, and so it's always been something that's been on the top of my head. And so it's, it's fun when you can actually solve a problem. You have a market that looks like it's, it's going to be, um, you know, potentially very profitable for you, but it also solves a problem that's going to change the world for the better. And that's why, um, you know, with, with Irby, with uh, designing something that is, is looking at, you know, how do you get around in a city that allows you to not have to drive a car, um, and I'm a big car guy, so, you know, um, but having, having that opportunity and, and doing it in a, in a very green and sustainable way is, is just really rewarding as a designer. Spencer, how about you? I mean, <clears throat> for me, it's more about having less stuff in my life and having being surrounded by quality uh, through and through. And so uh, considered, considered consumerism for me is, you know, being able to have an experience with the product or the person making the product that, um, that I'm buying. You know, being able to see how something is made, being able to know where the materials are coming from, being able to, um, you know, have something that actually lasts a long time, you know, I've, I've realized that over the years I've, you know, as I was younger buying things, like I just have all this stuff that I'm like, that's just like weighing me down. And so as I'm getting older and kind of more um, like thinking like more long term, I want to be um, as nimble and lightweight as possible with everything, but have uh, quality through and through surrounding, surrounding me. And Karen, it seems that there's a, a built-in conundrum to all of this. If you build a product like the products that these two gentlemen are building, and it's so great that you buy it once and then boom, you don't need to throw it away. Or if it's broken, then you can fix it. That's fantastic for the consumer, for the business. You don't get repeat customers, which is what a lot of businesses thrive on. How does that factor into all of this? Well, that'd probably be a good question. Uh, question for these guys to answer. However, I do think that there is this idea of diversifying your line. Um, there is the ability to engage with a consumer beyond just the product. So going back to, again, the services that could be involved, um, and I mean, we can get into the, the big technology conversation around Apple and their models and what they've done. Um, but I do think that it's you just have to look at it in a different way. And um, perhaps profit comes from ways of not selling more, but selling less in a more engaging way. Um, and perhaps then getting more customers than you would normally get because of that experience. But I think these guys could probably tackle that one. Yeah. I will have you do that. And also, I know that the folks who are here tonight had the chance to interact with some of your products out there. But because some people will be hearing about this on the radio and they don't get the benefit of seeing it, can you first of all Give us the basics of what your product is, how it's built, uh, and how you deal with that fact. If it's so great you're only buying it once, where does that leave you as a business owner? All right, I'll, I'll go first on this one. Um, so our product is called Irby. Uh, it stands for Urban Electric. Uh, it's essentially a personal transportation device to solve what is kind of commonly called the last mile scenario now. So it's essentially something that you can take with you when you go uh, on a train or a bus. Uh, you might want to throw it in the back of an Uber. 
uh, or a lift or even multimodal. You put it in the trunk of your car, you drive to a, an area outside of city center and then you have a way to kind of get around as you, as you, as you navigate the city. Uh, it allows you to not have to uh, pay for parking and, and deal with all the congestion and all that. Um, it's, it's made here in America. It's actually made in Pasadena, which is exactly where we're at. Um, so very proud of that. Uh, it's uh, very, very high quality, uh, how, we, how we build it. It's all made with aircraft aluminum and carbon fiber. It goes about 20 miles on a charge. It uh, has a top speed of about 15 miles an hour. And um, the idea behind it is that it folds up very compact so you can keep it with you at all times and it doesn't take up any space. And it's just, uh, and it's actually a lot of fun to ride. So a lot of people have a really good time with it. So if you buy an Irby, how long do you think it could last? Um, well, yeah, we're a startup, so we don't quite know that for sure yet. Yeah. But uh, uh, the idea is, is that we've built it to last. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very high quality product. And, and um, I think to answer your question, you know, does that sort of make it um, so that we don't sell more products to that same customer? Um, I, I think as designers in, in general, there's always this sense of making it better. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't think, I think our customers are definitely going to have their Irby's for life. Um, however, they, they might actually want to buy the next one because it's going to be even that much better. Yeah. Uh, they might sell it, uh, you know, as a, use, as a use product for someone else to have. Um, and the other thing about it is, is that if you build something that's very, very high quality, not only is it eco-friendly and, and all that, but it gets the word out. You know, people talk about products that they love. And um, so if we build something that someone isn't going to necessarily replace, that just means that we probably will sell, you know, two or three or four more because those people are really happy with it. And I imagine you're the first of your kind, too, really, right? So yeah, does that we're, help? I mean, it is interesting. There is, there is competition coming down mm -hmm. the pike. But uh, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's fun because it's, this was a trend that I, I saw uh, very early on. Uh, I did a lot of research on it. And, and, um, uh, you know, and it's, it's shifting. Everything's shifting. Our, in, in fact, the US is probably the slowest to this, to this, uh, to this market. Um, you know, this has been kind of been going on for a long time in Europe and, and, and overseas in Asia. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the world is becoming very, very small and everybody's moving into urban environments and there's not a lot of space for cars, so. Spencer, tell us about the stuff that's out front. What do you make? Uh, for the past eight years, every single day, uh, we've been designing, developing, manufacturing, and shipping uh, our own products. We make uh, backpacks messenger bags, weekender bags, uh, we make iPhone cases, kind of everything that you need to travel with. Uh, we also have gotten into uh, sporting goods, so we make like leather footballs, indoor mini basketball kits, boxing equipment, baseball gloves, uh, baseballs, baseball bats, um, and we've, uh, the thing that's really cool about what we do is that uh, it's all built, built from scratch. It's built in-house, it's built you know, we, our first factory was in downtown LA in the Arts District for the first four years. And then we were in Silver Lake after that, where we had a storefront and our factory was in the back. So people can come in and buy product from us and see our team working and building these leather, um, our leather products from start to finish. And, you know, they, they are really well built, made out of uh, a lot of the finest materials you can find, patented buckles. Uh, waterproof zippers uh, from Switzerland. Uh, we have like military spec webbing and a lot of like components that are going to last a really long time. And so, you know, I've been kind of fortunate enough to be uh, able to build my travel equipment uh, from scratch in my own factory and have been able to uh, do so every day with a great team of people. And having that experience of being able to go in, I'm just trying to picture in my mind, there's going to, let's say, a Big Five or a Dick Sporting Goods or something like that where I could get similar products, right? The backpack, yeah. the football, whatever. But I would imagine it's a really different experience walking into your store. Who is your consumer and where does that element, the, con the considered consumerism part of it, how does that factor in for them? 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of, I mean, there's, you can go get product instantly uh, so easily now, but I think um, as, you know, people want to get more um, refined with the things that they're purchasing and the items that are surrounding their lives, um, fortunately, the you know Instagram and the internet is allowed small businesses like me just making products that I haven't I wasn't able to find, and so I was you know I was looking for things that I wanted to buy that I couldn't couldn't find them, so I decided to make them, and our our customer is um, someone who appreciates design, appreciates architecture, wants to have um, you know quality items in their life, and and they want to. Um, you know, be different than everyone else. You know, I don't, I don't want to be shouting a logo or I don't want to be a part of a specific tribe necessarily. I kind of want to um, be under the radar, very minimalistic. Um, I don't, I'm, I, I'm trying to be as modest as possible and I don't, don't want to be kind of like, you know, why, why the sense. name? And it, which leads me to wonder, because I think you mentioned earlier before the scene began that Grant helped you out with the name. Why the name Kill Spencer? Somebody, I, I've always wanted to start a company ever since I was like a little kid with like the bind, my first product, the bind board. And I could never find a name that was, that wasn't taken. As I was getting older, I was looking for like, you know, dot coms and I could never find a name. I, I would come up with a name, I loved it. And then it was taken, you know. And so someone had written Kill Spencer um, at Art Center on on the wall at, in the Sinclair Pavilion, and like I look up and um, they it, didn't like you, right? I didn't know. <laughs> it was, was like it was, it was just like this Spencer. omen or something, I, and it was just this like really powerful powerful sentiment. And then I was like kind of like shocked at first, and um, I didn't know if it was my ex girlfriend who was mad at me <laughs> or a friend who was like messing with me, but it it was just like one of those things that. And um, at the time, I was like looking into like military chuck tarps and military fabrics, and um, I, I made my first bag out of um, a repurposed, used in combat military chuck tarp, and it kind of tied in with the project that I was working on, and it it just became what the brand is. And I mean, it's just a name, but I think what we do um, really makes it what it is. I'm going to ask the the very honest, direct question. Your products, let's say you're buying a Kill Spencer backpack, how much is that gonna cost you? Um, it, 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 it ranges, so we have uh, products that are in the $400 range to like $900. Okay. But if you think about it, like you buy, if you buy the best zippers and you buy the best buckles and you buy the best leather, that's gonna last a really long time. Yeah. And, and, and I'm gonna put it out there, I bought my husband for Christmas last year a really nice, I think it was L.L. Bean, like I spent good money on it, but it was kind of, it was a major brand, um, travel bag, and the zipper broke. And then and I had to take it in to like five different shoemakers, cause no, and by the time I, it cost me almost as much just to have that zipper replaced. So I get it, the need for something that you really know is gonna be there and reliable and durable. But Karen, I think a lot of people are gonna hear 900 bucks for a backpack, thank you very much, I'm off to big five. So how do we get people to buy into this? Well, no, I'll, I'll jump in, as a, even as a consumer, um, I own one of Spencer's bags, and it is by far the best laptop bag I've ever had in my life. So that's, oh, I'm a little you. biased, but the reason being- I have being, two products. <laughs> Well, I do have, to, actually, I have two, but that's, yeah. So, but the reason is, is it is because there's so much soul into it. So emotionally, I'm connected to it. Even if I didn't know Spencer, that the bag is just so, has such craft to it. So for me, I, it, it signals that, uh, for me, it's a signal to craft. Like, I really can embrace this bag. It has lasted longer. I, I go through bags a ton. I've never had a bag that lasts that long. So for me, the investment in the beginning offsets that I'm going to keep it for a long time. And I know if something goes wrong with it, I know who to call. Yeah. Right? Well, that's helpful. But I do have to say it kind of reminds me of the slide, the Portlandia slide, right? Where you could say, oh, if, if you're of this class or this section of, you know, of their demographics, you can do that. You can invest in soul. But there is a great part of our population who may be just as important or they might care just as much about keeping this planet going and, and being sustainable, but may not be able to afford that. How do we bring everyone into the fold? Well, I definitely, I, I see the opportunity that, and I kind of showed the example of Walmart with Big Box, and 
and this goes back to the power of design as well, along with things like materials and different ways of manufacturing. But we're starting to see some really well thought out, thoughtful items on shelves that are packaging related, that are everyday object related, that are at lower price points. And I think we're gonna continue to see this as there's a bigger commitment to the mass consumption to say, hey, we need to address these issues. And I think there's programs, take back programs, things like that, where there is your everyday affordability, but it's purpose driven. Uh, there's a different reasoning for buying. And then there's the ability to have a choice of something that is actually better than the product sitting next to it, perhaps. So I think that's kind of exciting. I think we're starting to see more options like that for, for all different price points, all different kinds of products. I have a really wonderful, awesome job. I like working in radio, but I have to say during that opening slideshow and seeing the maker fairs and the Etsy booth at Whole Foods, I thought, man, I want to do that. I want to make something. I want to run a business where I feel like I'm doing good in the world. And I'm sure there are days where you guys love your job so much. And I'm sure there are days where you think, why did I ever want to get into this business? What are some of the you challenges? Well. <laughs> yeah. What are some of the challenges of, of doing the work that you do, Grant? Uh, boy, uh, the, the biggest challenge is, is starting a startup, um, you know, funding it and uh, developing the product um, to the point where it, it's, it works and it's, and it's not going to break and all that. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy. In fact, I was, um, and I'm, uh, just to, to let you guys know, I'm, it's really special for me to be sitting here next to Spencer because Spencer actually uh, developed his line of bags in my class. I had him as, a, as an instructor. So it's, it's, it's just been fun to watch your, your path uh, of success uh, so far. It's been eight years now, you were saying. Yeah, so it's crazy. Yeah, it's Likewise for you, Grant, you've so. been inspiring. Well, ever yeah. since I was in college. Uh, so. <laughs> but, uh, um, no, man, I got off track there. I actually forget the question. No more, <laughs> no more love. Talk about the tough stuff, the really yeah, tough stuff. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get away from the tough stuff. I'm just talking about good stuff. Well, I think we're just, or the yeah. realistic stuff, because yeah. I think, you know, there are probably people here in our audience who think, I want to do what you guys are doing, and yeah. we're hearing all the benefits and, and the joys, but there are certainly those moments where making products that are of a certain ilk or like you said starting up your own business yeah. it's going to be tough yeah i mean I, I think for us you know one of the biggest challenges is is that uh the you know our product is so different than anything anybody's ever seen and and so a lot of the challenge comes with you know actually educating the consumer on you know what is this thing going to do for you because they've never they've never uh you know thought of having some kind of a little mini electric scooter that they can ride around on and it's 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 almost like I, I was telling Spencer before we started tonight you know it's it's kind of like this thing where you know about a hundred years ago when Henry Ford was developing the automobile you know at that time nobody really knew what they needed they didn't you know they didn't know they needed a car the, you know, and the, the famous quote is, if I had asked consumers, you know, I would, they would have said a faster horse and that whole thing. And um, so I, I kind of feel like we're we're at this little bit of a paradigm shift now with as far as personal mobility and and really where it's going in the future. And, and but, it, you know, it's difficult because unless you sit and ride an Irby, um, you don't know if it's really that easy to ride so a lot of people are very skeptical they you know they say well the wheels look too small you know what happens if i hit a pothole and you know the answer i usually give is well you're going 15 miles an hour you can probably maneuver around the pothole pretty easily but um you know so <laughs> but uh you know i i, I think that that becomes a, a challenge and, and honestly and, and you know like spencer you know we build a quality product here in the united states and that costs money uh, to, for us to do that. And so, you know, we have a relatively, um, you know, our price point starts at $1,500. And, and that's a bit of a threshold for a lot of people that have never really considered having a product like this. Now, all of a sudden, they're like, oh, yeah, I could use that. But eh, I don't want to spend $1,500. And so it's, it's, it's getting there. You know, people are talking about it. And we have great reviews on Amazon and things like that. And so a lot of people are really feeling the, you know, the compelled to, to make the purchase now, which is, which is good, but it, it takes time. 
and you're the guy who is, you know, jiggering pram wheels to the like you're the maker i would imagine it's really interesting it goes back to that side we have of all the different things the marketing the shipping all the rest of it is part of the work that that you have to do is teaching people not only how to make things but to kind of be the one man band the raising or the one woman band of raising the money and figuring out the shipping and all the rest of that well, I think just from from an educational perspective yes um, I mean, there's a responsibility that we have about teaching reality. And if we're saying that designers have responsibility to do all this good stuff, then we have to make sure that we understand a little bit about business and economics. We need to understand about the technologies and the materials and the manufacturing. And there's a lot of elements, a lot of hats that these guys have to wear in order to, to get success and a lot of trial and error to get there, I'm sure. You know, I mean, Spencer, you launched this way before crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. You know, you, you, you dug in and passion took you there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a grind. I mean, um, I wanted to make products. And so in order to make them, I had to buy a sewing machine, buy material, cut material, and sew it together. And the first product that I made didn't look like what I had in my head. And so uh, I learned really quickly that I need to have um, first of all, learn how to sew. And then on, on top of that, learn how to design, learn how to tell a story, learn how to communicate that story, learn how to build a website, learn how to photograph our product correctly, learn how to um, get people aware of the product, and then figure out how to box it and ship it and send it and deal with like customer service and deal with returns and deal with setting up a business. I mean, there's like, the, the list goes on and on and on. But the first thing for us that was the biggest difficulty was manufacturing. So, um, you know, I wanted to make product in my backyard. So I was in downtown LA going to all these cut and sew facilities trying to find a place that could make a product the way that I wanted it to be made. And I couldn't find the quality anywhere. And so I was working with one factory and going in there every day trying to get this guy Raul to help me make this product. I was like, no, stitch the lines at this thickness, at this, you know, I had to like call out every detail that I wanted and he couldn't do it. And he couldn't do it on time and it was expensive and he was, you know, there's like a lot of problems dealing with small manufacturing facilities. And, and then I had the opportunity to go to China and with a mentor of mine who ran a huge bag company that made 30,000 bags a day, I flew over to China, spent a week over there with a video camera, learning about every single detail, asking a ton of questions. And at the end of my trip, I realized that, you know, I do not want to make product in that way. I wanted to make product in my backyard. I wanted to oversee the product that I was making. I did not want to have to fly across the world in order to make product. Um, and so at the end of that trip, I came back and um, asked my mentor, essentially, if, if uh, I, I told my mentor, I was like, hey, I want to I want to build my own factory in L.A. I do not want to go across the world to build product. And he's like, OK, I'll help you. And he was my first angel investor, and I, he uh, cut me a check and to build my own factory in, in downtown LA in the Arts District. I got a bunch of tables, got a bunch of machines, and some tools, and I, was, I started the company. And in five months after that, I paid him back in full with interest, um, and he didn't take any equity in the company or anything. He was just, I paid him back in full, and then that was the beginning of how I started mine, my, my business, but you know, you can't do it alone. Um, you need to be surrounded by amazing people, amazing mentors, amazing family. And with, you know, the right kind of formula uh, or the, with the right support, uh, anything is possible, you know? And I think another big problem for me is that I have so many ideas and things I want to build, but I can't you know, go away from, I can't kind of like, change what I want to do, you know, uh, I need to stay focused on continuing to build and perfect uh, Kill Spencer and making that the best product, the best service, you know, that I can. And so that's, that's kind of, um, you know, it's really amazing to be able to do that. But at the same time, like I have ADD, like I want to make everything. Considered cloning. That's what we yeah, really need I to know. move to so there could be exactly. more Spencers. 
In just a few moments, we're going to open it up to the audience for questions. So if you've got them, start thinking about them now, and we'll give an opportunity for folks to ask some questions in a few moments. But first of all, and, and I, I want to put this delicately because I know it's a, a sensitive time right now and a time that a lot of us are all processing in our different ways, but when you talk about going to China and seeing there and making the decision that you wanted to keep your business here, there is a lot in this country and in this world that is likely to change as a result of the election that happened this week. And there's still a lot of specifics that we don't know. But I have to imagine that in the past 24 hours, business owners across the country are thinking, OK, what is this country going to look like for me? What are changes in leadership going to mean for my business? And again, I don't want this to necessarily get into any sort of political debate, but I am curious just to get your, we didn't plan on necessarily having this event two days after a major stunning political event, but this is where we are. So I'm curious if any of you would like to weigh in on what, what considered consumerism might look like in the years to come. Well, I mean, I, I think what's, you know, what, what Spencer's doing and building this product and, and the reasons why you said you wanted to build it here um, in America are, are very similar uh, ways that, uh, sim similar um, how I feel about this as well. And in fact, I, I uh, debated on um, building our product overseas in, in China. In fact, uh, I had gone there a number of times. I had some, uh, some initial ideas on how much it would cost, and we did a crowdfunding campaign and, and raised money, and the money was based on what I thought it would cost to produce it over there. And we, we ran into a lot of difficulties as well, having to go back and forth and just not, not necessarily getting the quality that we were looking for. And when we um, were looking for funding uh, for our company, I, I met through a mutual friend, an investor that was local here to Pasadena, and um, he was very interested in the product. And um, he, you know, he said, well, you know, I, I would like to, to lead this round of funding and get people behind you to support you, uh, but on one condition. I want you to, to build the product here in the United States. And um, yeah, I kind of sort of was like, well, one part of that sounds really good, you know, the money part. And then the, the other part is like, I, I don't know if I can. And so what was interesting is, is, is that that point it really pushed me to, to look at the possibilities. And it turned out that, you know, this country was, was built on building products. And, and, and um, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I think that there is a, a sense right now of, of, of companies that are, are building products in the U.S. that, um, that it's looked at as, as uh, not only are Americans wanting to buy American-made products, I think even more today than, than 10 years ago, but I, I, I think that uh, the world is actually uh, looking to, to us as, as being a leader in, in manufacturing. And um, you know, it, it really resonates when we tell people that we build this product right here in Pasadena, and you know, and, and our, our assembly line is actually on Colorado Boulevard. Uh, you know, there's some reasons why financially that actually makes sense for us, but it doesn't, you know, <laughs> you, in Old Town, I mean, come on, it's funny. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, oh, that's another story. Um, but you know, I, th I think that uh, I'm excited about the fact that we are kind of blazing this trail of made in the U.S. And, yeah. Karen, Spencer, yeah, you want to wait? I'll jump in just, uh, again, from a sort of long tail future view. Uh, designers are typically very optimistic. And I think, you know, uh, one of the things I think we pride ourselves on and what I have great admiration for Spencer and Grant is their determination the determination to make something really, really quite remarkable, um, beautiful products in this case. I think one of the issues that I'm thinking about with this week is how do we continue to be nimble? How do we continue to be great problem solvers, take on any sort of challenges that are given to us? We're really good at problem solving. So for us, I, I think there's not as much anxiety knowing that, well, we're just going to have to figure it out because we can make it happen. So I think that's the message that we're really trying to, uh, to convey to, to our students and, um, and learning how to react and pivot if needed and, and make it happen. I'm going to be doing this for a lot longer than four more years. So um, 
you know, I think uh, with whatever can happen with the economy or whatever is going to happen with our president and whatever initiatives are going to be, um, you know, put into to place, we have uh, a very specific niche product and um, we have a very strong customer base and, you know, we have our own factory. I can change exactly what we make whenever I want. And so I can cut out our entire product line and change it if we need to for whatever reason. But uh, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think we're, you know, being able to design and manufacture products here in my own facility uh, with a team of people who want to build whatever we come up with as a team is going to be um, uh, going to allow us to be nimble enough to overcome whatever obstacle is in our way. I'd like to open it up to the audience at this point. So if you've got a question, I'm seeing a couple hands. Let's start right here. We've got a gentleman right there. Hi, I'm Mike. Thanks for being here. Um, my question is, how are you avoiding the culture of accumulation? It sounds like you're finding customers who are all ready to avoid on the customer side of accumulation, but your investors and yourselves, like the point of a business is to get rich and put your feet up, right? I mean. It may not be your drive, but that's certainly the drive of the system you're in. And I'm curious, you know, how powerful that is. Do you have to resist that on an everyday basis? I mean, for me, I could have went to China right away and made millions of dollars very quickly. Like we make product that's, you know, 100 times better than a lot of these companies who are making a similar product that's less expensive. So, you know, I think, um, you know, I'd, the idea of becoming getting rich quick, I think, is a myth. You know what I mean? And you know, to the responsibility that comes with that might not be what you you want. For me, I, I wanna have a really wonderful lifestyle and I work really, really hard and uh, hopefully one day I'll be able to, you know, have an all encompassing lifestyle. But um, I think that, you know, accumulation um, is, you know, I think that there's, you know, um, I don't know how to answer your question, but basically, I th you know, I think uh, to the get, the get rich quick mentality, I don't think is is as easy as everyone thinks. Any other questions? We've got one right there in the second row. Uh, my poor mother had to put up with the uh, machine shop off the kitchen, so uh, um, I built an electric car factory twenty years ago. EV1 had just come out as a market killer. I have a friend who has 100 acres of peaches, and he told me that if he ever sold a ripe flat of peaches, it would be the last peach he ever sold because the market business, the marketing business, is about shelf life. My point is, is that how do you get around the inertia and create a product that can really be meaningful to change the ecological question? Uh, when Art Center gets most of its money from Detroit, when the status quo is what's dr driving the, the big issues of cars and such. And these are little trinkets, and I love them, but we've got some major moves to make in the next few years. I'm uh, treasurer of the Green Party of California. I, I, if I'm, I'm trying to understand the question as far as where we've been traditionally, and I think the question is regarding automotive industry specifically. Things take decades and decades to change. Um, my electric car factory fell on its head 20 years ago. It's, and now almost every taxi in this town is electric or at least hybrid. So we don't have 20 years to wait, we can build really excellent product on a small scale with little things, but it's the big stuff that, like automobiles and transportation. And we build our roads every five years out of the waste product from gasoline. That, that's the asphalt we're driving on. That's a real issue. We don't need to be doing that. That's the waste product from making gasoline. I mean, I mean I, I, that's part of the reason why we're making the Irby, you know, because it's it's actually, it's it's changing this this mentality of needing the big automobile, needing the car, and 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 really, um, you know, that's what that's what excites me. 
Um, you know, I, I know that Art Center is, is, is very known for its transportation design program, and, and like I said, I'm, I, love, I love cars. I think they're a thing of beauty. And, um, but, the, but Art Center, and I think Karen can speak to this too, Art Center is very, very focused on, on designing for change. And what does that mean in, the, in the, not only the, the distant future, but the near future? So I think uh, I, th I think it's uh, very much at the top of of a lot of conversation about how how is it that we can make products that are meaningful that really do drive this this idea of change. And it's at scale, and I, I know what you're saying. It, you know, uh, maybe footwear is a, a little bit of a different creature um, than a, a large automotive vehicle. Um, I think one of the things that I can speak for specific to Art Center is there is more dedication towards systems thinking, taking on the, the, the bigger issues. Um, our graduate transportation design program is all about systems thinking. So it's not just about the vehicle, but it's the entire um, experience around moving from point A to point B. So a lot of work, it's really hard um, to do that. And, uh, but we are, we're, we're, we're tackling not just the product, but the systems around it on this side. Hi. It sounds like you both put a lot of attention to creating quite durable products. And I just wondered if you might be able to speak a little to any considerations you might have put towards offering sort of product guarantees or warranties and, and trying to kind of shift that risk um, from the consumer who's buying a product that could go faulty onto sort of the producer. Well, we, we do offer um, a one-year warranty on all our products. Um, so, and we, we've um, had um, a number of things, that, you know, people have brought us back their Herbies for different reasons or whatever. And we, we, one of the great things about building it here is that we have, we're very nimble, we can, we can do that. So, um, yeah, I, I think there is this sense of wanting the customer experience to be, um, you know, just this pleasant experience through and through. Um, obviously, we are doing everything we can to make make that um, a very uh, positive thing for our customer. Uh, we have a repairs department, which doesn't really get used that often, but uh, we have the ability to, if like a zipper breaks, you know, if it gets run over by, or whatever, if it breaks in some way, um, then we can definitely fix and take care of product. We have our own factory, so we can do that really quickly a lot of companies that uh, imagine anything that you guys are wearing or you have right now trying to sending sending it back and getting it fixed is might be very difficult with us it's an open book and we're obviously here to help our customers as much as possible hi <coughs> so um i have two questions but you, you feel free to answer one or both one was i wanted you to if you can talk about brand loyalty, and do you uh, basically put that put thought through brand loyalty when you make your products? Do you think, or do you think that, uh, do you project consumers to not really care about brand loyalty and it's somewhat artificial? For example, Apple at one time, it was such a cult, but as it grew, brand loyalty was kind of artificially built in by not be able to move from one platform to another platform. So with your own product, do you put that into consideration for, for the future? That, okay, is there such a thing as brand loyalty or the next person with the best price and the best quality is gonna have a shift? Another question I had for when you, Spencer, when you mentioned the list of the things you had to go through, it seems for someone who wants to start overwhelming or somewhat scary, you were listing all those, you know, from sewing machine all the way to all the other details. So when you went into your endeavor, did you were you aware of all of that, or you learned as you went by, and was that a blessing that you weren't aware of all of that? Yeah, I mean, it's. I did not know that it was going to be as difficult as it is to make a product and ship it to a customer. Um, and I'm still learning eight years later. Every day, there's like problems that you just have to solve, and you have to go to work knowing that there's going to be issues. Um, and so that's just a part of running a business, I think. And so if you know that, then that's cool. Um, the brand loyalty question, I think that, you know, that has a lot to do with, uh, it's out, brand loyalty is out of my control, you know. Um, you know, people, 
who like our product like our products because of what we do and how we um, carry our our business, the products that we make and the decisions that we make. If we start changing those decisions and making things in different ways, then that loyalty might shift. So I'm dedicated to building something very specific and I'm the one driving that ship right now with my business. And so hopefully people will respond to the things that I value and the brand loyalty will come naturally from from that. And I think for the on the brand loyalty uh, question for us, I, I think it's there is a sense of, you know, okay, if you've had a really great experience or your friends have had a really great experience with a certain brand, then you're going to be probably inclined to lean towards that brand. However, um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, the almighty dollar starts to kind of play a role. And, you know, that's that's a big challenge for us because the, the products that are coming on the market that are competing against us are not the same quality. They're not made in the U.S. They're, you know, they're, they're solving the same problem per se, but, um, you know, it's, it's definitely more of a price point thing. And, um, you know, I, I think where the brand loyalty comes in is, is, is not necessarily, well, I'm just going to buy it because they were the first ones or they were the best ones. But I'm, I'm going to buy it because I, I know that these guys really care about what they're doing. And I know that they're going to produce a product that is, that is um, superior. And I can, you know, kind of rest assured. It's, it's, it's sort of difficult to, you know, buy a, some kind of an electric scooter or something and uh, from a company uh, on Alibaba and have it shipped to you. And then if it goes, if it breaks, you know, I don't know how you're going to get it replaced. So um, I, th I think that's where the brand, <coughs> the brand loyalty thing comes into play for us. And I, just to summarize, for, from my perspective with both of these two companies, it's really about authenticity. And I think that really does come through in everything. If, if when you get a chance, if you haven't had a chance to look at the stories behind the product that they're creating, um, it really resonates. Um, and it has, it just has this great quality story and a commitment and an authenticity that I think, you know, really not knowing for sure, but I imagine that, you know, you've got a loyal crowd <laughs> that is, um, will be engaged with you for the, for the long run. You guys have done a great job explaining the manufacturing and kind of the output of what you guys produce. But can you talk a little bit about the supply chain and how you source components and materials to fit into this model of sustainability? Well, that probably applies more to me than Spencer. I think you make everything here, right? I mean, I, no, I don't make zippers. I don't make buckles. I don't Australia make hardware or something. Yeah. Yeah, we, we get leather from all over the world, actually. We get leather um, from Italy. We get le leather from South America. We get uh, vegetable tan leathers from the East Coast. Um, you know, trying to find the best material has been, um, it's like a whole, there's, we have a whole catalog of materials like in my, the back of my office. And um, finding materials that will last the test of time is kind of a mission. Finding materials that are made in responsible ways making sure we can get uh, enough of them to fulfill orders. Um, you know, if we're ordering uh, zippers from Switzerland, which are the best, m most durable zippers that, that I can find, we have to order them in large quantities and we have to order them with eight, sometimes eight weeks, um, or sorry, eight, yeah, eight weeks um, of, of time before we get that. So like, there's a lot of, you know, our, our solution to that product, our, our solution to that is to just buy the best materials that we possibly can. And typically when you're buying materials from companies that are making really good uh, products, they have spent years and years and years developing that one single thing that they make every day. So um, when you take a lot of those components and put them into one bigger component, one bigger manufactured product, then, you know, you're, you're um, only as strong as your weakest link. And if we don't have any weak links, then it's pretty, you're pretty good. And uh, uh, for Irby, um, whatever, w you know, pretty much whatever we can build here, we build, but there's a lot of things obviously that uh, 
that are involved with the product itself that uh, frankly just either it doesn't exist or it really just doesn't make, make sense financially for us to you know uh, try to source it in the US so there are a number of uh, components that we have to uh, bring in and it's it, there is a little bit of a sort of a, a fine line of okay well when do you when do you order that how much inventory do you bring in how much do you build here to, to meet up with that so uh, fortunately that's the kind of um, stuff that that I've been able to pass on to some of some people that are a lot more qualified than, than me at our company that handles all of the inventory but um, um, yeah I mean we work with the best vendors, uh, so we, we do a lot of, um, of vetting of different uh, companies overseas that are producing the, the, the components that we need to incorporate. And so we feel very good about our partnerships over there. The, no doubt uh, you can get really great product, um, but you have to, you know, some of that stuff you have to pay for. So we pay a little bit more and we get the better stuff. This question is uh, mainly for Spencer. How do you balance sustainability with leather? Because I, that would be a deal breaker for me. Yeah, I know that. Um, that's actually something we're working on right now. Is trying to figure out how to get better leather. That you know, leather is um, from an animal, and every skin is different. And you know, uh, a lot of customers expect um, our product and the leather to be completely flawless. But that's actually um, the flawless leather comes from a lot of uh, different types of uh, chemicals and processes to make it look flawless, but a lot of our leather is natural um, cowhide, and so you can see the skin texture. And um, the sustainability aspect is, you know, we have, um, we use only so much for each bag, and we have a lot of material left over. And so um, I started having these trash bags filled with like thousands of dollars worth of the most amazing material in smaller pieces and I didn't know what to do with it. So we started making boxing equipment, speed bags. We started making footballs. We started making soccer balls. We make, started making baseballs. And so we're using a lot of the uh, excess material to um, put into items that could um, get torn up really easily or can, can you know, um, be okay with being worn. I, I, I'm not more like going vegan. I oh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of uh, materials out there that are, um, you know, synthetic that um, are really, really good. I think there's something about um, leather that is an organic material that just lasts. Leather is a byproduct of the food industry, and so that's not really going to go away. Um, you know, there's the material that we use is, is, is amazing, and it is, I think, far superior than a lot of synthetic materials, which might be made in ways that uh, couldn't harm the environment. So, do you know a lot about vegan leather? Yeah. My shoes are made in LA for my company, but it's uh, all vegan shoes are made in LA. So I support. I love cool. the LA stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. It's just I, I just kind of think that sustainability works against having animal products. Yeah, I, I see the long-term uh, play with that for sure, and I, I would love to um, learn more about the materials that you're, are on your shoes and how they, how they wore over time, for sure. And, and I know that probably after hearing about all this too, I just want to remind folks that both Spencer and Grant have their products outside, and in a few moments we're going to wrap up here. So do you have the, I think it's going to be a whole new thing looking at those footballs and the rest of it now that we've heard the story behind it. But I, I think it's interesting that that last question uh, came from a vegan because one of the, the last question I'd like to put to you tonight comes to how we get to the consumer. And I bring up the vegan just because I think that there is a, a certain analogy to be made made as I see it in this country when it comes to food and how we eat. And for a long, long time in this country, we ate the things that we could grow because that was pretty much the only options we have. And then we figured out how to tinker and process and add sugar and color and smell and all the rest of it. And the next thing you know, you have flaming hot Cheetos, which <laughs> I'm sure works well for some people. I still, I will never eat a flaming hot Cheeto in my lifetime. It terrifies me. Um, I, I do feel like there is a movement that's happening now in this country back towards 
eat what you can identify, the whole Michael Pollan, like if it didn't exist in your grandmother's time, don't eat it, um, is resonating with a lot of people. And I think that a lot of it comes from an environmental aspect. Some of it comes from a nutritional aspect and a health aspect. As for some people, it just feels right. On the consumerism front, on the product front, I feel like our mentality is not quite there yet. You know, you walk into a Costco or a Target and there's so much stuff, all the stuff that you mentioned, Spencer, and it's so cheap and it's so easy that I think it's hard not to to be the flaming hot Cheeto consumer. So so my last question for the EVD2 is how do you feel like we get this country moving towards the appetite to literally changing our palate when it comes to what we buy? And Karen, we haven't heard from you in a while, so let's start with you. I'll, yeah, I'll jump in. I, I think, again, there's a, and going back full circle to the beginning, I think there's definitely a mindset of perhaps this next generation that wants to engage in something that is beyond just what's the obvious on the shelf. So for instance, if there is a great story about um, a bioplastic, perhaps, that has the same quality, same craftsmanship, but has a far better benefit, you might pay a little bit extra for that. But I'm being optimistic that I think we have a generation of people that are going to want to invest in that. There, I think there's going to be a greater care for, for things like that. And then on the other side of you know what technology, I think, can do, which I think is really exciting, is providing uh, alternatives to, to waste that we had. I think you know Spencer talks a lot about trying to use, and I've seen him use the patterns and use as much material as possible. So I think how we think about responsibility is, well, does that product can it be disassembled, um, knowing that, yeah, I need to have some ugly componentry in there for it to actually work, but what is the, what's the system behind it? What's the ethic behind it? Who's making it? Where is it being made? And I go back to, I think, that kind of big data knowledge about the behind the scenes and that kind of transparency, I think, is really going to change people's mindset or how they approach buying things. Okay, I mean, I, I love the idea of like pushing the boundaries with, uh, you know, challenging norms. I, I chose leather because it's a, a material that's just resilient over time in cold and hot conditions. But, you know, if, if we talk later and I find a material that's, that's new, like I c we can change it right away and, and use, you know, I'm, I'm open to that. Like I, I make the decision, you know, so uh, I spent a lot of time working with uh, Shimaseki, like these like weaving machines that are used to make all like the Nike fly knit. Uh, shoes where you can literally make product out of thread. And if the thread is sustainable or comes from a uh, source, then there's ways totally around leather. Um, so for me, I think the future is, is, is wide open and there's so much possibility, and especially with like 3D printing and robotics and so many different, you know, I spend a lot of time at Caltech and I spend, uh, I have a lot of friends at NASA JPL. I'm like learning about tons of materials and processes to be able to start you know, drawing from these new technologies and advancements, there's like so much possibility of what we can make next, you know? And and we actually just came out with an orange Irby and, and actual flame inserts. So we have the Flaming Hot Cheeto product. <laughs> what a perfect, and, and you know orange is our color, Grant, here at KPCC. Uh, I, uh, so uh, I, as it is Art Center. There you go. Um, I think we need the KPCC Irby. I'll bring it over. I, I want to give a huge thanks to our guests this evening, Karen Hoffman, Chair of the Product Design Department at Art Center College of Design, Grant Delgatti of Irby, and Spencer Nicosi behind Kill Spencer. And thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. Have a good night.